Welcome to the Saddleback College Emeritus Institute Dorothy Marie Lowry Distinguished Guest Lecture Series, recorded in Spring 2020. Thanks also to our faculty moderator, Mrs. Laura Hoffman. For more information regarding the Emeritus Institute, please visit our website at www.saddleback.edu forward slash emeritus. Today, I am so pleased to introduce Jean Pasco. Her talk is going to be timely. I've been looking forward to this. Um, so here we go. Um, Jean spent 30 years covering Orange County politics and government as a reporter for the Orange County Register and the LA Times. She's won multiple Orange County Press Club awards, including Best News Story, Best Politics Story, and the Watchdog Award for Investigative Reporting. She spent 10 years as a regular political correspondent on KOCE Television Channel 50 and was an occasional member of the Orange County Journalists Roundtable on KPPC Radio. In 2007, she left the Times to become director of the Orange County Archives for the County of Orange and later was the Orange County, or it's Orange County's public information officer. She served on the boards of the Orange County Press Club and the Orange County Public Affairs Association. So I'm with great pleasure, Jean Pasco. Well, thank you, Laura, and thank you for allowing me to be here and present this talk today. As Laura said, I'm Jean Pasco, and I spent 30 years as a reporter, and then uh, I had my second chapter uh, at working for the County of Orange, ending up as a public information officer. And then I retired in 2017 so I could uh, take off on the road and travel the country in an RV and visit national parks. Uh, we've been to Civil War sites, Revolutionary War sites. You'll see some of the photos in the, that we've taken in the presentation today. Um, but uh, it's been it's been a, a wonderful retirement so far. I was hoping to see you all in person, but uh, this is the next best thing. And now I'm gonna head over to my presentation. So enough about me. Let's talk about our fraught politics of the moment and uh, what history tells us about our chances for weathering this particular storm. In his farewell address, uh, in, uh, in 1796, George Washington really warned about uh, the, the weirdness of political parties uh, when he was talking to future leaders. And this, this quote really sums it up. The alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, natural to party dissension, which in different ages and countries has perpetrated the most horrid enormities, is itself a frightful despotism. Well, we've certainly had our share of frightful despotism in recent years at the presidential campaign level. Uh, here's, here's just a taste of some of the things we've heard. Quote, Barack Obama is the founder of ISIS. He was the most valuable player. I give him the most valuable player award. I give her two, by the way, Hillary Clinton. Quote, if Hillary Clinton can't satisfy her husband, what makes her think she can satisfy America? Quote, he, John McCain, is a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured. Quote, you know, just to be grossly generalistic, you could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. I regret saying half, that was wrong. Quote, He's taller than me, he's like 5'2", which is why I don't understand why his hands are the size of someone who's 5'2". Have you seen his hands? And you know what they say about men with small hands. Quote, it's not surprising then that they get bitter. They cling to guns or religion or antipathy to people who aren't like them. So these are the, some of the things that have been said and let's frame our discussion from there. <clears throat> 
Since the beginning of our democracy, with our passion for politics and embrace of the First Amendment, presidential campaigns stuffed with accusations, taunts, and challenges have kind of been baked in. It's almost a rule of thumb that politicians cast their opponent as immoral or corrupt. You know, there's a reason for this. You've got to motivate your voters. And psychology tells us again and again that people are more motivated by negatives than they are by positives. So getting back to General Washington, this is exactly what he was warning about in 1796. Washington spoke about the, quote, baneful effects of the spirit of the party, which he said is inseparable from our nature because human beings will inevitably disagree about issues. Excessive partisanship, he wrote, quote, agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarm, kindles the animosity of one part against the other, foments occasionally riot and insurrection, unquote. And this is all about a partisan system that isn't even mentioned in the Constitution. So here we are 220 years later and truer words were never spoken. By August 2017, just eight months after President Trump took office, three quarters of Republicans had negative views of Democrats and 70% of Democrats viewed Republicans negatively. This was a huge increase compared with the mid 1990s when about 20% of each party had unfavorable views of the other party. You can see from this slide from the Pew Research Center that this icy divide is only getting frostier and even more disturbing for democracy, roughly half of voters of each party said the other party makes them feel afraid and growing numbers said they view the policies of the other party as a threat to the nation. So that's bad and unfortunately it's getting grimmer. Two years later, in 2019, we'd gone from 76% of Republicans feeling cold toward Democrats to 83% feeling that way. The 70% of Democrats that gave cold ratings to Republicans in 2017 had now gone to 83%. This is not good for brotherly love. Based on this growing trend of agitation that we see in politics, it certainly seems that we are more divided and polarized than ever. So here's another sobering look from Pew. This shows that people acknowledge the growing divide among the parties and a Apparently they seem to be okay with it. So is there any hope then for common ground amid all these chasms? We all certainly hope so. Oops. So let's go to the most, the 10 most divisive presidential campaigns that we've seen uh, in our history and how the public dealt with the back and forth at that time. Let's start with 1800, John Adams versus Thomas Jefferson. Almost immediately in our history, Washington's warning about partisan incivility went unheeded as John Adams and the Federalists clashed with Thomas Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans. Adams and Jefferson had started out as friendly rivals. They'd been key officials in Washington's administration, even as they disagreed over how best to operate the world's first constitutional republic. The election of 1800 was a rematch of the previous election in which Adams won a narrow victory in both the popular vote and the electoral college. Both men were determined to win at all costs and in another political tradition, they dispatched surrogates to attack each other because they didn't want to do it themselves. Jefferson secretly hired the famed pamphleteer James Callender who painted Adams and the Federalist Party as toadies to British royalty and Adams as being bent on starting a war with France to further an alliance with King George. Callender and Adams had some history of their own. Callender had been prosecuted and imprisoned by the Adams administration for violating the Sedition Act. Callender dove straight into the gutter by describing Adams as a, quote, repulsive pedant, unquote, and gross hypocrite, a hideous hermaphroditical character, which has neither the force and firmness of man, nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. The Philadelphia Aurora, which backed Jefferson, 
referred to these stout atoms as his rotundity. Not to be outdone, a Federalist publication described Jefferson as, quote, a mean-spirited, low-lived fellow, the son of a half-breed Indian squaw sired by a Virginia mulatto father. Allegations were made that he had cheated his British creditors, was a supporter of French radicalism, and condoned assassinations of the aristocracy, and that he made a habit out of sleeping with his female slaves. Citing Jefferson's early admiration for the French Revolution, a Federalist editorial asked, quote, are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames, hoary hairs bathed in blood, female chastity violated, or children writhing on the pike and halberd? I don't even know what a halberd is. Another Adam surrogate publicly suggested that if Jefferson were to become president, quote, we would see our wives and daughters the victims of legal prostitution. A newspaper warned that Jefferson would create a nation where murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will openly be taught and practiced. At the time, states got to pick their own election day, so voting ran from April to October, and you thought waiting for the polls to close these days was frustrating. There also existed a complicated pick two voting structure in the Electoral College. So the election ended up a tie between Jefferson and his vice presidential pick, Aaron Burr. Both men got 73 electoral votes. That sent the tie-breaking vote to the House of Representatives, not all of whom were on board with a Jefferson presidency and a Burr vice presidency. Seven tense days of voting followed, but Jefferson finally pulled ahead of Burr. The drama triggered the passage of the 12th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which stipulates that the Electoral College has to pick the president and the vice president separately, so they would do away with this runner-up complication. As a historical note, the pamphleteer, Calendar, served jail time for the slander that he wrote about Adams. He got out of prison in 1801, went back to journalism, and a year later broke the story that had been circulating as a rumor that Jefferson was having an affair with Sally Hemming. In a series of articles, Callender wrote that Jefferson had lived with Hemings in France and that she had given birth to five of his children. The story was dismissed by many as just anti-Jefferson slander. But in 1998, DNA testing indicated a link between Hemings' descendants and the Jefferson family. I took this photo when we visited Monticello in 2017. So Hemings has been acknowledged at Jefferson's museum, but it's really such a shame that we don't have a face to put with her name. By the way, in, in 1812, Jefferson and Adams became friendly again after beginning to write letters to each other. They continued to trade correspondence until they both passed away on July 4th, 1826, which was the 30th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Now let's go to 1828, John Quincy Adams versus Andrew Jackson. The 1828 election is commonly referred to by historians as the dirtiest campaign in U.S. history. We may be rewriting uh, history on that one, but we'll have to see. John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams, and Andrew Jackson were both members of the Democratic Republican Party, and they had previously run against each other in 1824. That election was another of the few elections in U.S. history decided by Congress because none of the four major candidates running at the time secured an electoral win. In what became a widely believed a bit of shenanigans, Speaker of the House Henry Clay, who had also run in the 1824 election, allegedly made a deal with Adams to convince enough, enough House members to vote to elect Adams over Jackson. Clay then, ta-da, cast a deciding tie-breaking vote in Adams' favor to give him the presidency. Clay was then rewarded by being named Adams Secretary of State. The deal became known as the Corrupt Bargain of 1824. A disgruntled Jackson and his supporters then broke from the Democratic Republicans and created the Democratic Party. So by the time Jackson and Adams faced each other again four years later in 1828, Adams was ready. 
he'd collected dirt on Jackson and he and his surrogate started slinging. One thorny issue revolved around the marriages of Rachel Jackson. Andrew Jackson was Rachel's second husband. When she was young, she had married Louis Robards in Harrodsburg, Kentucky. It was an unhappy union and she separated from him several times. Eventually, she moved back home to Nashville and that's where she met Andrew Jackson. By this time, Robards had actually started divorce proceedings, but unknown to Rachel, the proceedings were never finalized and she apparently was still technically married to Robards when she married Jackson. Oops. Although the marriage details were later resolved, it became a campaign issue during the election and it was a doozy. Adams supporters called Rachel Jackson a convicted adulteress and a bigamist. Jackson was branded an adulterer who had stolen another man's wife. The Jackson campaign countered by accusing Adams of having engaged an American woman to provide sexual favors to the Russian czar while Adams was ambassador to Russia. They accused Adams of using public funds to buy a pool table and of gambling in the White House. Adams supporters accused Jackson of murdering six of his own militiamen. One Adams uh, newspaper wrote, quote, General Jackson's mother was a common prostitute brought to this country by British soldiers. She afterward married a mulatto man with whom she had several children, one of which number General Jackson is one. A handbill also accused Jackson of being a cannibal, if you can believe that, and claimed that after massacring more than 500 Native Americans in one evening, quote, the bloodthirsty Jackson began again to show his cannibal propensities by ordering his bowmen to dress a dozen of these Indian bodies for his breakfast, which he devoured without leaving a fragment. In the end, Jackson won the election, but Rachel, who had been increasingly ill during this campaign, died before the inauguration. She was buried wearing the white dress and shoes that she had bought to wear for the inaugural ball. At her funeral, Jackson blamed his opponents for killing her. Quote, may God Almighty forgive her murderers as I know she forgave them, Jackson said, I never can. Jackson and his wife are buried out back at their home hermitage in Nashville. And this is a, another photo that, uh, that we took while on our trip. It's interesting to me, her gravestone inscription is 134 words. And it was an ode penned by her grieving husband who blamed her death on stress from the gossip that had circulated during the 1828 campaign. I won't read it all, it's, it's actually pretty, uh, pretty poignant, but it includes uh, Jackson's belief that, quote, a being so gentle and yet so virtuous, slander might wound, but could not dishonor. It's interesting that his grave has only three words on it, General Andrew Jackson. Here we go to 1860, which is Abraham Lincoln versus Stephen Douglas and two others no one ever remembers. It goes without saying that 1860 was a fraught time for our Republic. The Republican Party had been founded six years earlier by a group of renegade Democrats, Whigs, and political independents who opposed the expansion of slavery into new US territories and states. At the Republican convention, front runner William H. Seward of New York had antagonized conservatives who feared that his radical statements about an irrepressible conflict over slavery and a higher law than the Constitution would cause problems. Hoping to carry moderate states like Illinois and Pennsylvania, the party then nominated Abraham Lincoln. The Democratic Convention, which met at Charleston, could not agree on a candidate and most of the Southern delegates bolted. Reconvening in Baltimore, the convention now just composed of Northern Democrats nominated Senator Stephen A. Douglas, also of Illinois. Southern Democrats had met separately and chose Vice President John Breckinridge of Kentucky. A group of former Whigs and members of the American Party, also know, known as the Know Nothings, formed the Constitutional Union Party, I hope you're following along, and nominated Senator John Bell of Tennessee. Now, Lincoln and Douglas 
infamously had sparred before, infamously now, uh, during the 1858 Lincoln and Douglas debates, which occurred during Lincoln's unsuccessful attempt to unseat Douglas for the U.S. Senate. Campaigning in the presidential campaign was vicious from the start. Douglas's backers at the Charleston Mercury newspaper called Abe a, quote, horrible looking wretch who was sooty and scoundrelly in aspect, a cross between the nutmeg dealer, the horse swapper, and the nightman. Douglas accused Lincoln of being a drunk, saying that Lincoln could, quote, ruin more liquor than all the boys in town together. Lincoln was mocked as a two-faced liar who resembled a gorilla. Douglas said, Lincoln is the leanest, lankest, most ungainly mass of legs and arms and hatchet face ever strung on a single frame. Democratic supporters also published a pamphlet falsely claiming that Lincoln was encouraging Irish immigrants, then viewed with anti-immigrant prejudice at the time, that he was claiming that uh, Lincoln was encouraging them to marry former slaves. For their part, Lincoln and the Republicans put out handbills calling Douglas a lost child with this description, quote, left Washington DC some time in July to go home to his mother, who was very anxious about him, seen in Philadelphia, New York City, Hartford, Connecticut, and at a clam bake in Rhode Island. Answers to the name Little Giant. Talks a great deal, very loud, always about himself. The Little Giant remark was a reference to Douglas's height. He was 5'4", Lincoln was 6'4". Lincoln ended up winning the Electoral College with 180 votes to 72 for Breckinridge, 39 for Bell, and only 12 for Douglas. And yet it's really Lincoln and Douglas that we remember. Lincoln won a popular plurality of about 40% ahead of Douglas, who was second in the, in the uh, plurality of the vote. Breckinridge came in third and then Bell. It remains the poorest showing at any time by any winning presidential candidate in American history. Now the campaign vitriol didn't end with the election. Does that sound familiar? This is from the March 1861 New York Illustrated, which shows the two sides of Lincoln as seen by the North and by the South. I took this photo at the Lincoln Presidential Museum in Springfield, Illinois. The following rant, and I'm gonna to need to take a breath when I uh, read this, was printed in the Salem Advocate, a newspaper in central Illinois, and it was circulated as Lincoln approached Washington by train for his 1861 presidential inauguration. Quote, the illustrious, honest old Abe has continued during the last week to make a fool of himself and to mortify and shame the intelligent people of this great nation. His speeches have demonstrated the fact that although originally a Herculean rail splitter and more lately a whimsical storyteller and side splitter, he is no more capable of becoming a statesman, nay, even a moderate one, then the braying ass can become a noble lion. People now marvel how it came to pass that Mr. Lincoln should have been selected as the representative man of any party. His weak, wishy-washy, namby-pamby efforts, imbecile in manner, disgusting in manner, have made us the laughing stock of the whole world. The European powers will despise us because we have no better material out of which to make a president. The truth is Lincoln is only a moderate lawyer and in the larger cities of the Union could pass for no more than a facetious pettifogger. Take him from his vocation and he loses even these small characteristics and indulges in simple twaddle, which would disgrace a well-bred schoolboy. And we're finally at the end quote. Okay, you know, you read these words now and you cannot believe they're said about one of our country's most beloved leaders. But the advocate had plenty of company at the time. An esteemed orator, Edward Everett, wrote in his dire quote, it is evidently a person, he is evidently a person of very inferior cast of character, wholly unequal to the crisis. From Washington, Congressman Charles Francis Adams wrote, quote, his speeches have fallen like a wet blanket here. They put to flight all notions of greatness. 
Vanity Fair, which I didn't even know was around at the time, wrote, by the advice of weak men who should straddle through life in petticoats instead of disgracing such manly garments as pantaloons and coats, the president-elect disguises himself after the manner of heroes in two shilling novels and rides secretly in the deep night from Harrisburg to Washington, unquote. The Brooklyn Eagle, in a column titled Mr. Lincoln's Flight by Moonlight Alone, which was a reference to his entrance to Washington while in disguise, suggested that the president deserved, quote, the deepest disgrace that the crushing indignation of a whole people can inflict, unquote. The New York Tribune joked darkly, quote, Mr. Lincoln may live a hundred years without having so good a chance to die. And there are echoes of the 1860 election that linger today, as I found when uh, we were on the road and we stopped in Springfield, Kentucky a year ago when we were in our RV because we saw a sign on the road that said Lincoln statue. So we said, okay, we're gonna stop. So we were pretty amazed with what we found there. And, and this is the statue of Lincoln in Springfield, Kentucky, uh, along with a couple of interesting plaques. It seems Lincoln fought a political smear during the 1860 campaign, proclaiming that Thomas Lincoln and Nancy Hanks had never married. So Lincoln was born out of wedlock. Lincoln's attempts to obtain the marriage records were unsuccessful. In fact, they weren't found until 1878, attesting that indeed his parents had legally wed on June 12, 1806. The 1860, was so, 1860 campaign was so nasty and so disparaging of Lincoln that the folks in Springfield, Kentucky clearly put some effort into assuring that their native son's parentage would never be disputed. As you can see, here's the Lincoln statue with a bronze plaque attesting to the marriage of Thomas and Nancy Lincoln. And there's a second plaque across the street, again declaring their marriage, and saying that the records were found in the courthouse that had stood at that site. Now, uh, here's a fun fact. Actor Tom Hanks reportedly is third cousin four times removed from the former president through Nancy Hanks Lincoln. So let's go to 1872, Ulysses S. Grant versus Horace Greeley. Uh, President Ulysses S. Grant ran against New York Tribune editor Horace Greeley in that, that campaign. Uh, Greeley, because of his frequent injections uh, into society and politics through the newspaper, had become something of a celebrity in his day. Greeley headed an uneasy coalition of Democrats and liberal Republicans, who regular Republicans had taken to call soreheads, who were dissatisfied with what they saw as corruption and bribery within the Grant administration, and they were disaffected over Reconstruction. Greeley was endorsed by the party despite a history of attacking Democrats in the pages of the Tribune. Democrats called Grant a dictator and a drunk. They produced and circulated a booklet calling the Grant administration, quote, a crowning point of governmental wickedness, Bribery and corruption have seized all the avenues of public life. Robbery, murder, and assassination are of daily occurrence, and guilty perpetrators escape through the solemn mockery of law. Greeley ran on a platform of civil service reform, laissez-faire liberalism, and an end to reconstruction. The Republicans supported civil service reform and the protection of rights for African Americans. They attacked Greeley's record of changing alliances. They attacked his support of utopian socialism. And they even attacked him for being a follower of the dietary restrictions of Sylvester Graham, known as the father of American vegetarian. Now, Graham happens to be a personal hero because he's the inventor of the graham cracker. So back to politics. Then came the widely circulated anti-Greeley cartoons in Harper's Weekly drawn by famous political illustrator Thomas Nast. Nast was a Republican whose nascent political cartoons had been first launched to devastating effect to take down New York Democratic political heavyweight boss William Tweed and his Tammany, Tammany Hall ring in New York City. In the cartoon on the left, Nast drew Greeley praying to Satan to win, 
with the White House and the Capitol Dome in the background. In the cartoon on the right, the derogatory Shylock is August Belmont, who was born Jewish in Germany, although he converted to Christianity in the 1840s after settling in the US. Now, he was supposed to represent the Rothschild banking firm in New York, and he also chaired the Democratic Party during this period. This, this nasty cartoon was clearly a reference attempting to, on, on uh, Greeley trying to buy the election and a, a blatant image of anti-Semitism. Now here's another NAS cartoon from September 1872, where Greeley is shaking hands with murderer John Wilkes Booth. This one's a little sketchier to decipher because Greeley actually was a supporter of Lincoln's as well as a correspondent and critic. Nast seems to be saying that electing Greeley would dishonor Lincoln's sacrifice, which you can imagine how potent that would be at the time. At age 61 at the time of the election, Greeley had previously been known to Americans as this eccentric Uncle Horace and was, if not revered by some, at least followed. During the campaign, he went around the country giving as many as 200 speeches a month, and he urged Americans to just bury the hatchet and join hands over the bloody chasm of the Civil War, which is not exactly what this thing depicts. One irony was that Greeley had been an original founder of the Republican Party in 1856. He was an early abolitionist and critic of secessionist rebels during the Civil War, but he had turned his back on the party in 1872 over Grant era scandals. By November 1872, in large part after getting hammered nearly weekly by Nast and his cartoons, Greeley called himself, quote, the worst beaten man who ever ran for high office. He ended up winning just six states to Grant's 31, calling only 66 electoral votes to Grant's 286. Nass cartoons had so distorted his public persona that he wrote, quote, I hardly know whether I was running for president or for, for the penitentiary. Finally, he collapsed in exhaustion and despair after the campaign, and he was carried to a sanatorium in Pleasantville, New York, where he died on November 29, 1872. He remains the only presidential candidate to die before the election was finalized. So here we, here we are in 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes versus Samuel Tilden. Now, the election of 1872 was barely a memory, and, and here we were at it again. The election of 1876 was set against a backdrop of public outcry for reformers to tackle the problem of public corruption. Grant's second term had been marred by allegations of graft and other improprieties, and he was removed from the ticket in favor of Ohio Governor Rutherford B. Hayes. The Democrats selected New York Governor Samuel Tilden, who had made a name for himself by sending legendary Tammany Hall boss Tweed to prison. The Republicans, marred by the scandals of the Grant administration, took the fight to the South and conjured images of the Civil War. They attempted to link the lifetime New Yorker Tilden to the Southern Democrats who had kept African Americans as slaves and who had fought the four-year war against the U.S. government and assassinated President Lincoln after their loss. They contended that Tilden was a notorious womanizer who had affairs with married woman, women and who had contracted syphilis from an Irish prostitute. The Democrats' tactics in the South included instigating race riots and shooting at African Americans who attempted to vote. They spread rumors that Hayes had stolen money from an army deserter who was on his way to be hanged, and that the teetotaler governor had shot his own mother in the arm in a fit of drunken rage. The result of the election of 1876 actually is still debated. Tilden defeated Hayes in the popular vote, but did not capture a majority of the Electoral College vote, thanks to three Southern states in Oregon failing to ratify their 20 electors. Was what became known as the Compromise of 1877 was struck, in which Southern representatives agreed not to dispute the election in return for Hayes' withdrawing of all federal troops from the South, thus effectively putting an end to Reconstruction. 
The contest went to a special electoral commission who by an eight to seven vote awarded all of the disputed votes to Hayes. 1884, James Blaine versus Grover Cleveland. This is another doozy. During the 1884 US presidential election, Republican candidate James Blaine, a longtime political figure from Maine, was already facing a political back backlash from accusations of trading favors for cash. In Washington, Blaine had served as Speaker of the House during Reconstruction. He was elected to the Senate in 1876 and had briefly been a presidential candidate that year, but he dropped out after being implicated in a fi financial scandal involving railroad stocks, for which Blaine, of course, claimed his innocence. So it helped Blaine that the Republicans had some choice dirt all ready to fling at his impotent Democrat, Grover Cleveland. Ten years earlier, Cleveland had had a relationship with a woman named Maria Halpin, which resulted in the birth of a child that may have been Cleveland's, despite the two having never married. Cleveland's campaign had no hesitation in admitting that he and Halpin had indeed been, quote, illicitly acquainted, unquote. Cleveland claimed Halpin had been generous with her affections, including some of Cleveland's friends who were prominent Buffalo businessmen. As the only bachelor in that group, Cleveland said he was unsure of the child's paternity, but nevertheless claimed the boy as his own and gave little Oscar Folsom Cleveland his name. Now, Oscar's middle name was the family name of Cleveland's best friend, Folsom, and this, this will come up later. Cleveland also claimed to have found placement for the baby with a loving family. So what's the big deal, right? Halpin, on the other hand, had a very different story. She said Cleveland forced himself upon her and then, after Oscar was born, had her locked up in a mental institution. Republicans, meanwhile, had a heyday branding Cleveland lecherous and a debaucher. In an October 31st, 1884 interview with the Chicago Tribune, Halpin proclaimed, quote, the circumstances under which my ruin was accomplished are too revolting on the part of Grover Cleveland to be made public. She had been a 38-year-old widow in 1874, according to the Tribune, which also reported that Halpin said Cleveland had pursued her relentlessly and that she finally consented to join him for a meal at the Ocean Dining Hall in Oyster House. After dinner, Cleveland escorted her back to her boarding house. In an 1874 affidavit, Halpin strongly implied that Cleveland's entry into her room and the incident that transpired there was not consensual. He was forceful and violent, she alleged, and later promised to ruin her if she went to the authorities. Halpin said she told Cleveland she never wanted to see him again, but five or six weeks later was forced to seek him out because she was in the kind of trouble that only Cleveland could help her with. Doctors from the Providence Asylum, where Halpin was briefly admitted after Oscar's birth, said during interviews in 1884 that she had not appeared in need of committal. The Chicago Daily Tribune reported, Dr. William G. King, an honored citizen of Buffalo, was then attending physician at the Providence Asylum. When visited by a telegraph reporter last week, he said that he remembered Maria Halpin well. He said she was not insane, though she had been drinking. He concluded that, quote, the managers of the asylum had no right to detain her, and she left in a few days, and that, that is as soon as she was able to choose to after this terrible experience. As it turned out, Oscar Cleveland was adopted by the asylum's Dr. King and raised in Buffalo, separate from his birth mother. Cleveland supporters claimed that Halpin had just been looking for a quick buck at, by trying to extort Cleveland to pay for her to be quiet. Claim, excuse me, Blaine continued to be accused of shady dealings with the railroad, which was said to have been confirmed when a letter was found in which Blaine acknowledged that he knew he was involved in corrupt business. He had signed the letter with, quote, my regards to Mrs. Fisher, burn this letter, unquote. A number of Republicans couldn't support Blaine because, Blaine because they believed that he was corrupt and they threw their support behind Cleveland. The faction of Republicans supporting Democrats was dubbed dubbed mugwumps by the press, referring to an anglicized version of a word used by Massachusetts Native Americans to mean war leader. I had to look that one up. 
In this context, it meant someone who was independent of their party. During the campaign, Blaine attended a meeting in a Protestant church in which a minister chided those who had left the Republican Party by saying, quote, we don't propose to leave our party and identify with the party whose antecedents are rum, Romanism, and rebellion. That phrase may ring a bell with some, and because it actually coined another infamous political taunt. The attack was aimed at Catholics and Irish voters in particular. And when Blaine failed to counter that insult, many believe it cost him the election in New York City. In the end, Cleveland narrowly defeated Blaine with Democrats breaking a six consecutive election, 24 year losing streak, the longest for any major party in American political history. The taunt that had been used against Cleveland was then added with a final line, gone to the White House, ha ha ha. The scandal was soon replaced on the front pages by breathless coverage of Cleveland's new bride with a familiar last name. Frances Folsom, daughter of the president's best friend, became the first woman to be married in the White House. And at 21, 27 years younger than her husband, she became the nation's youngest first lady. By the way, in case you're wondering, first lady Melania Trump is 24 years younger than her husband. I took this uh, photo as well. It's in the, um, so I think, uh, Keystone, uh, South Dakota at the Presidential Wax Museum. I thought it was fascinating. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Oscar Folsom Cleveland, the child who, who started all this dust up. Uh, well, actually the parents did, but um, he apparently faded from public view. And according to a comprehensive 2013 article in Smithsonian Magazine, he seems to have come of age amid privacy. Some believe that he changed his name, took his, his adopted father's surname and became James E. King Jr and he was a Buffalo gynecologist until he died childless in 1947. Maria Halpin remarried and lived in relative obscurity until her death in 1902. According to her obituary, her last wish was that her, uh, her funeral, funeral would not be made public because, quote, she dreaded having strangers look upon her dead face, unquote. Meanwhile, Cleveland won a second term for office after a four-year sit-out, elected in 1892 by defeating Republican incumbent President Benjamin Harrison. Cleveland remains the only president in American history to serve two non-consecutive terms in office, 1885 to 1889 and 1893 to 1897. 1912, uh, 1912 the election of William Howard Taft versus Theodore Roosevelt worth, uh, versus Woodrow Wilson. In 1912, William Howard Taft and Theodore Roosevelt were friends and work partners who nonetheless entered both their names for consideration for the Republican presidential nomination. Things quickly degenerated. The two once respected and close-knit candidates just started attacking each other ruthlessly with name calling and criticism. Vice President Roosevelt had become the 26th president of the United States in 1901 after the assassination of William McKinley. Roosevelt was then elected outright in 1904, and he picked Taft to be his Secretary of War. While in office, Roosevelt began an initiative that he called the Square Deal. This populist set of policies pushed for greater equality in the workforce, increased rights for women, and enhanced environmental conservatism, excuse me, conservation. Tra uh, Taft became Roosevelt's personal choice to succeed him in the White House because he believed Taft would continue his policies. Well, things didn't go exactly according to plan. Although Roosevelt helped Taft win the presidency in 1908, Taft sympathized more with the conservative wing of the Republican Party over the progressive wing, which is uh, what Roosevelt championed. So after returning from a year-long safari in Africa, Roosevelt came back only to realize that Taft wasn't exactly running things like a Roosevelt. He wasn't quiet about his frustration, and supporters started to divide into camps within the Republican Party between Taft's conservatives and Roosevelt's progressives. Roosevelt had promised not to run again for president, but as time went on, his progressive compadres requested that he return to the campaign trail. Taft told confidants that he felt betrayed by his former friend. The final split between Roosevelt and Taft came during the 1912 Republican Convention in Chicago. 
Roosevelt believed his platform called the New Nationalism was more representative of the times. Refusing to accept the nomination of Taft as the Republican candidate, Roosevelt and his supporters bolted to form the Progressive Party, which was also known as the Bull Moose Party. Well, that ended the friendship for good. Taft argued that Roosevelt would become a dangerous radical and become, quote, the most dangerous man in history. He said his plans to create a more active government through the square deal would ruin the country. Roosevelt struck back against Taft, saying he was a man of political crookedness. He called Taft, quote, a fathead with the brains of a guinea pig. In the end, the constant fighting between the two men opened the door for Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, to become the 28th president of the United States. As a footnote, Socialist Party candidate Eugene V. Debs received nearly one million votes in that election. The election of 1812 also was unique because it marked the first time a party split to form a third party to elect a specific nominee. It remains the only time in US history that a previous president ran again for election as a third party candidate. And let me add here a quick note about term limits. Even though George Washington set something of a precedent by serving just two terms, there were no presidential term limits for much of our history. The move to term limits came with the 1944 election when Franklin D. Roosevelt became the first president to win a fourth term. He had also become the first president to win a third, third term in 1940. FDR's opponents and those worried about the consequences of no limits on the number of presidential terms pushed successfully for congressional passage of the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution on March 24, 1947. The amendment was submitted to st the state legislatures, which completed ratification on February 27, 1951, and with the requisite 36 of then 48 states, it was passed. At the time, Alaska was not admitted as a state, wasn't until January 3rd, 1959. Hawaii wasn't admitted until August 21st, 1959. The amendment prohibits any individual who has been elected president twice from ever being elected again. An individual who fills an unexpired presidential term lasting more than two years is also prohibited from winning election for the, for more than a second term. 1928, Herbert Hoover, it's hard for me to say that, Herbert Hoover, yes, say it three times real fast, versus Al Smith. Well, this was another nasty election. But instead of spreading the mud, the, nasty, the nastiness apparently was almost solely directed at New York Governor Al Smith, who had the distinction of being the first candidate for president who worshiped as a Catholic. His religion wasn't the only lightning rod for opponents. Smith was tarred with an alleged connection with, here we go again, Boss Tweed's Tannley, Tannley Hall, even though the connection was only that Tweed's ring had backed several of Smith's early campaigns for public office. Added to Smith's purported ties to Tammany Hall was the fact that he was an ardent opponent of prohibition when it was still a very sharply divisive issue. Prohibition was enacted in the United States through the Volstead Act, which became the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. It instituted a nationwide ban on the production, importation, transportation, and or sale of alcoholic beverages from 1920 until the amendment was repealed in 1933. Republicans and their supporters, who had nominated California's Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, for their ticket, seized on Smith's political background his religious background, and his alleged love of boozing. Protestant ministers across the country rushed to make their claim that a President Smith would be completely beholden to the Vatican instead of the Constitution, and that the Pope himself would relocate the Holy See to the United States to rule the country if Smith won. Republicans characterized Smith as a notorious drunkard while Hoover's wife made public statements to the effect that Smith regularly engaged in embarrassing public behavior and that he would name a bootlegger to be Secretary of the Treasury. Here's another doozy that was accepted by some as fact. At the time of the election, New York's Holland Tunnel was being completed 
Now, Republicans circulated photos of Smith at the mouth of the Holland Tunnel, declaring that it really led 3,500 miles under the Atlantic Ocean to Rome and the basement of the Vatican. Now, this has all the echoes of this, the weird Hillary Clinton campaign running a child porn ring from the basement of the DC pizzeria. So, some things never change. Smith was accused of a plan to make Catholicism the national religion. In Dayton Beach, Florida, the school board there instructed that a note be placed in every child's lunch pail reading, quote, we must prevent the election of Alfred E. Smith to the presidency. If he is chosen president, you will not be allowed to read or have a Bible. Hoover's backers said Smith engaged in, quote, card playing, cocktail drinking, poodle dogs, divorces, novels, stuffy rooms, evolution, nude art, prize fighting, actors, greyhound racing, and modernism, unquote. An anti-Smith poem printed on leaflets spread in New York in 1828 read like this, quote, when Catholics rule the United States and the new grows a Christian nose on his face, when Pope Pius is head of the Ku Klux Klan in the land of Uncle Sam, then Al Smith will be our president and the country not worth a damn, unquote. Hoover, meanwhile, just kept repeating his very benign presidential slogan, quote, a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Well, you can imagine Smith was unable to counter the dirty campaigning by Hoover supporters, and he lost the election in a landslide. Hoover won 40 out of the 48 states, including Smith's home state of New York, and grabbed 444 electoral votes to Smith's 87. Smith retired to private life and became the president of a real estate development corporation that eventually went on to build the Empire State Building. And Smith had somewhat of a last laugh with, with within a couple of years, Hoover's name became synonymous with the shanty towns that sprang up across the country as a result of the economic collapse of the Great Depression. Some, some folks may remember Hoovervilles. Now we're, we're getting a little more contemporary with 1964 Lyndon B. Johnson versus Barry Goldwater. And because this is kind of in my time frame, I have a Goldwater story, but I'll, I'll tell you that uh, as we move on. What many consider the most effective negative campaign ad in modern politics was employed by President Lyndon B. Johnson in 1964. The televised campaign commercial alleged essentially that electing Barry Goldwater would result in nuclear destruction and dead children. In 1964, Goldwater was an unapologetic conservative and staunch anti-communist who had weathered several televised attacks from his Republican opponents during the primary campaign. They criticized his vote against the 1964 Civil Rights Act and they labeled his call for complete defeat of the Soviet Union as a precursor to nuclear war. Goldwater was unwavering in his positions, paraphrasing the Roman Emperor Cicero in his convention speech when he declared that, quote, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, unquote. Against this backdrop, President Johnson decided he wanted a boost from his position as chief executive to go after Goldwater. So he commissioned both the FBI and the CIA to gather intelligence on Goldwater's campaign, going so far as to order the campaign plane to be bugged. Johnson's surrogates linked Goldwater to the Ku Klux Klan, and the news media compared the 1964 GOP convention to the atmosphere of Germany circa 1933, hailing the rise of Adolf Hitler. There was a Goldwater joke book called You Can Die Laughing and a children's coloring book in which kids could color pictures of Goldwater dressed in Ku Klux Klan robes. Another tactic was to write letters to columnist Ann Landers under the guise of ordinary people who were terrified of Goldwater becoming president. Goldwater and the Republicans had a few tricks up their sleeves as well. They produced a book entitled, A Texan Looks at Johnson, A Study in Illegitimate Power. The author said Johnson was guilty of all types of vote buying and sleazy politicking. Even worse, the book alleged that Johnson 
was said to be responsible for the murder of several business associates and even the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. With these tactics swirling in the background, the Johnson campaign then dropped what became known as the Daisy ad. The Daisy ad portrayed a small girl in a peaceful meadow picking the petals off of a daisy as she counted down the number of them remaining. Her voice segues into an ominous sounding launch countdown as the camera zooms into her eye, followed by a cut to an image of the mushroom cloud of a nuclear explosion. The Daisy ad launched what unfortunately has become a tradition of the televised campaign attacks. Let's have a look. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. either love each other or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Goldwater lost the election in a historic landslide. President Johnson got 486 electoral votes to Goldwater's 52. He only won six states. So now we're down to our final example, which is not of presidential politics, but it's an example of what happens when frightful despotism takes hold in the houses of power. You know, generally we've tended to save our public displays of anger for the campaign trail. And then once the election's over, the halls of Congress are supposed to be exempt. Although as we see, there have been recent displays that drew howls of protest from the other side for lack of decorum. But the granddaddy of decorum breaches is our last political confrontation, what became known as the crime against Kansas. Let me set the scene. On May 19th, 1856, the temperature reached 90 degrees in the old Senate chamber, which was packed. At 1 p.m., Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner rose to speak. It had taken him two months to schedule floor time. Remember, this is you know during lead up to the uh, to the uh, Civil War. The crusading anti-slavery Republican wanted to address the contentious issue of whether Kansas should be admitted to the Union as a slave state or a free state. Sumner was 6'2", and the average height for men at the time was 5'6". Sumner had carefully written every word of his speech and arranged for an advanced edition to be printed at 112 pages long. By the time he entered the chamber, he had memorialized every word of the address that he entitled The Crime Against Kansas. Sumner, a member of the new Republican Party that had formed that year, spoke for five hours over two days. He singled out two Democratic senators as principal culprits in the crime of supporting slavery. The first was the leader of the Senate Democrats, Stephen Douglas of Illinois. Sumner had previously characterized Douglas as, quote, a brutal, vulgar man without delicacy or scholarship, who looks as if he needs clean linen and should be put under a shower bath. Turning to Douglas, Sumner called him out by name as a, quote, noisome, squat, and nameless animal, not a proper model for an American senator. Then Sumner focused on Senator Andrew Butler, who wasn't even present that day. Mocking the South Carolinian butler as a man of chivalry, Sumner charged that he had taken, quote, a mistress who, though ugly to others, is always lovely to him, though polluted in the sight of the world, is chaste in his sight, I mean, the harlot slavery, unquote. Three days later, the Senate was adjourned and Sumner sat at his desk, signing his postal frank 
to envelopes containing the printed speech, which he was going to have sent out. And in, in some trivia here, frank is the word for a mark that's placed on mail to indicate the right to send it free of charge. It stems from the French affranchir, meaning to exempt from charge. I looked that up too. I, I never knew what that meant. While seated, Representative Preston Brooks, who was Senator Andrew Butler's second cousin, entered the Senate with a wooden cane. Waiting for the women in the audience to leave, Brooks told Sumner, I have read your speech twice over carefully. It is a libel on South Carolina and Mr. Butler, who was a relative of mine. Brooks then slammed the metal topped cane onto Sumner's head. As Brooks struck again and again, Sumner lurched blindly about the chamber, futilely attempting to protect himself as the force of the blows broke the cane. Bleeding profusely, an unconscious Sumner was carried away while Brooks walked calmly out of the chamber without being detained by the stunned onlookers. Overnight, both men became heroes in their respective regions. Talk about a polar divide. Surviving a house censure uh, as punishment for the attack, Brooks resigned, but he was reelected to another term in November 1856. He actually never made it back to the house because two months later, he succumbed to a deadly bout of croup, a type of bronchitis, at age 37. Sumner recovered slowly over the next three years, and he eventually returned to the Senate, where he remained for another 15 years. He died of a heart attack on March 11, 1874. Kansas was admitted to the Union on January 29, 1861, as a free state. The confrontation came to be known as Bleeding Kansas, a term that was coined by Horace Greeley's New York Tribune, which helped publicize the attack. The headline suggested to Americans that disputes between North and South were unlikely to be resolved without bloodshed. The episode further pushed sentiment further toward the inevitability of civil war, which was triggered four years later, as we know, when South Carolina became the first state to secede from the Union. So there you have it. Is there a lesson in all this? Well, let's go back to uh, the Pew Research Center's numbers. The most recent numbers indicate that Americans believe our country is as political divided as we were during the Vietnam, Vietnam War. Following the 2016 election, Americans said they were just dreading the idea of discussing politics with their friends and loved ones, a sentiment that we've skittered right back into for 2020. You know, when you talk to folks on the right, they're convinced that the rhetoric and violence from the left is the worst they've ever, they have ever seen and nothing like their side has ever produced. And when you talk to the left, they say the same thing about the right. And each side has their own set of anecdotes to prove it. The fringes on both sides insist that only some new radical, unapologetic, in-your-face ideology will save America from drowning in a sewer of appeasement. You know, it, it's the old us versus them thing that we just cannot seem to get away with. But this, again, seems to be kind of baked in. There's a famous study from 1954 by social psychologist Muzaffar Sharif that's germane. 22 11 and 12 year old boys were split into two groups and taken to Robbers Cave State Park in Oklahoma. Now, neither group knew about the other, but they were encouraged to form allegiances and friendships within their own group. Then competition was introduced between the two groups, one of which called itself the Rattlers and the other self named themselves the Eagles. Well, you can guess what happened then. Baseball games quickly devolved into name calling. Vandalism hit each of the other's camps and there were inevitable fist fights that elevated to rocks and sticks before the researchers intervened. It's a classic example of why the more we hunker into closed groups, the more our civility suffers. Studies have shown that it's tougher to be ugly to friends and family than to those we don't know or don't know well or to those we refuse to get to know. The upshot is that there's wisdom in what our mothers always told us, if you can't say something nice, then don't say anything at all. You know, I wanted to end here with a mention of this unique time that we're living in, 
which is really not that unique in many respects when you look back into history. In 1918, a deadly flu outbreak swept across the globe, infecting hundreds of millions, and it killed 675,000 people in the United States. By comparison, World War I had killed 100,000. Because of World War I and what was going on at the time, the federal government commented on what was misnamed the Spanish flu. It was only named that because Spanish newspapers had written about it first. But the government commented on it in terms of its threat to war readiness, particularly because it was striking down military aged men in their 20s and 30s. You know, this 1918 was not a presidential election year, so the blame game appears to have taken a hiatus. President Woodrow Wilson apparently said nothing publicly about the illness, which he is generally believed to have contracted in April 1919 at peace negotiations in Paris, and he kept his condition a secret. In 1920, the Republican Party gathered at its convention in Chicago and selected Ohio Senator Warren G. Harding as its nominee to succeed Wilson. Democrats chose another Ohioan, Governor James M. Cox, whose running mate, by the way, was Franklin D. Roosevelt. Harding is probably most known for anointing the world word normalcy into the American lexicon during a May 1920 speech in Boston. But, you know, I, I looked and there doesn't appear to have been any political traction taken to blame Democrats nationally for an action against the flu, since most of the public health responses were taken at the local and state level. And that's where the unhappiness remained. Now, fast forward to today, and, you know, you see near daily uh, media screeds and commentary and, and uh, of course, the president's uh, often very defensive uh, briefings, but we'll leave that for another lecture. So thank you all for staying with me, and I would be happy to respond to some questions. I'm going to end the PowerPoint slide so I can look at you in, in full screen. Jean, thank you so much for uh, an enlightening talk on the history of, of the political process and what, what history has shown us. And you have also demonstrated that political nastiness is nothing new. Um, so much of the nasty political commentary these days gets amplified by being shared on social media. Uh, presidential campaigns in the past were vicious enough, as we learned, but um, that mudslinging was in newspapers and magazines. Um, hasn't social media made things even worse? Yes and yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, social media at first was seen as a way that, you know, you could get good information out. It would be a way to um, to remove the barrier between information and individuals so it wouldn't become filtered through something else. And what we've seen is that, yes, that has happened, but also social media spreads a lot of junk and it, it becomes very difficult for, uh, you know, for a reasonable citizen to, to filter through that and figure out, you know, what's real and what is fake. And, you know, this whole concept of fake news has come into play. Um, and, you know, whether that's just because you don't like what's written or indeed the whole thing's fake, you know, it, it really becomes um, a little bit confused. But yes, social media uh, is really has become the way that a lot of people get their news. Um, as of two years ago, uh, television coverage was still uh, about half of uh, about half of Americans got their news from television coverage, and about two years ago, interestingly, social media overtook daily newspapers as the uh, means for which people receive their news. So, in kind of cascading order, it went TV, then it went news websites, radio, social media, and dead last was print newspapers. Only 16% of Americans got their news from newspapers. So I think it really puts more of a responsibility on the consumers of news to make sure they vet uh, what they're consuming. Gene, in 2016, the last presidential election, we saw insults going back and forth probably at the same rate as those in the previous elections, as you highlighted. 
this turn friends against friends and family members against family members. Um, and as we come into another presidential election, how would you suggest or do you even see relationships thawing uh, in such a divisive time when insults are going back and forth, not only between candidates, but really between family members who may have different political ideologies? Well, I'm kind of hoping that the 2016 election f helps frame this one uh, because it was it was really so bad. I can't tell you how many friends unfriended other friends on Facebook because things just got so nasty. And I think people have kind of decided uh, that they're going to take their own personal approach. They're going to, you know, they're not going to unfriend people, but at least they will uh, not comment all the time on on you know political things that get posted. I know I know in my own family uh, we have differences of opinion on you know our approach to um, certainly national politics, and you know it's kind of a, an agree to disagree uh, stance uh, that we've taken, and you just. Uh, I really hope that we see more um, emphasis on civility because the whole point, you get back to Washington, his whole warning about political parties was what he saw is that the parties will amp up, you know, the rhetoric and the nastiness and the us versus them because it suits their purposes. But that kind of nastiness does not suit our purpose um, as humans and as family members and friends. And I think that over time, we're just going to have to make our own decisions about what level of nastiness we're going to accept and engage in. Mm. And really, we need to learn to accept people and their opinions with respect. And speaking of nastiness, um, other presidential candidate, candidates, although you've given us a lot of examples of throughout history, this sniping and these incredible insults. Um, in recent times, you think that they would save their nastiest comments uh, to friendly audiences. Uh, but then we have our current president who's on Twitter almost daily calling out anyone he perceives as an enemy. It, do you believe that is gonna uh, hurt, a, hurt him coming in November this year? Well, you know, the, the whole tweet storm thing with President Trump is really fascinating because that truly is unique. It was certainly unique to 2016, but, but that was when he was a candidate. What I think has been even more unique is the tweet storms while he's sitting in the Oval Office, because we have not seen that before, where a president just directly, you know, spews out what he's thinking, uh, kind of off the cuff, uh, to the American people. I mean, he's got millions and millions of tw uh, Twitter followers. I mean, I kind of call him the riffer in chief. He'll, you know, he just goes off on what he thinks. And, and I'll tell you, the people that support President Trump love it. They, they find that connection so important because they have felt left out of the political process in so many ways, you know, you hear on and on about the elites and, and even, you know, academia, where they feel like uh, if, you know, if they're not, uh, you know, on the left coast or uh, they're not at a university, then their opinions don't matter, you know? And so there's a lot of support for him reaching out directly. And frankly, for, um, I think for the American people, okay, you know, love him or hate him, he's talking to everybody. And so will that hurt him in the election? I think it really depends on how people respond to that. But the other dynamic of how his administration um, has been leading the country and the things that have happened, um, I think will have probably have more of, a, of an impact. But boy, I, I can just see the campaign ads um, coming up for 2020 because they're just gonna list all the tweets and they're going to cherry pick tweets and both sides will do that. And uh, it's, it's, um, you know, it's going to be another wild ride. Jean, final question. Um, I'm curious if you could expound a little bit on how um, PAC money has influenced politics over the last couple uh, presidential house Senate races seems to me that more and more money is flooding to candidates now, perhaps even then before, and how that may have be influencing politics in this day and age compared to historical eras. 
Well, PAC money and uh, independent expenditure committees have a huge impact. And really, it was the uh, Citizens United U.S. Supreme Court decision of several years ago that essentially gave a green light to a lot of the spending. And the thing with, with PAC money and independent expenditures, there's, you know, there's supposed to be a distance between the candidate and these kinds of campaigns and messages. And you can raise a lot more money than you can. The candidate is restricted in how much you know, per individual um, contribution they can receive. But PACs can get you know, pretty much whatever they, whatever they want, and then they go out and push stuff out. Now, when you look back, even in, even in 1800, um, the, uh, the, the candidates were using surrogates. So essentially PACs and these independent expenditure campaigns have become surrogates. And so the candidate can take the high road and then all the, you know, the really vicious stuff comes in through the PACs and then they just repeat again and again and again because there's so much money available to them to get these messages out. So it will, again, it's gonna have a, a huge impact. And there have been a lot of calls for the Supreme Court to revisit uh, Citizens United. It doesn't appear that that's, uh, that that's going to happen, but it's the political reality. And again, I think as, as we are informed uh, citizens uh, and, and we have our civics responsibilities, we need to look at what, we, what we're viewing, analyze it, analyze it for, um, for clarity and, you know, what we think is actually the truth and kind of, you know, go from there. But we are, you know, it hasn't started yet. The COVID situation has pretty much just, you know, uh, sucked all the, uh, the, you know, air out of the room as far as any other messages really that we're getting. But hopefully this will calm down and we'll, we'll move ahead medically. But then things on the political stage, of course, at that point, we'll open up and, uh, and we'll see all the, the TV ads and, and particularly all the social media stuff. Just one last question. What about the Barry Goldwater story? Oh, I forgot to tell the Barry Goldwater story. Okay, like with all of these candidates, this is the only one I actually met. So I'm working as a reporter at the Prescott Courier in Arizona, Prescott, Arizona in 1980. And Barry Goldwater, obviously from Arizona, he came to give a speech at an auditorium in Prescott. I had made arrangements in advance to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with him for the Courier. And so generally those happen after whatever public appearance the candidate makes. Well, we're, he's in the middle of the speech and somebody calls in a bomb scare right? A bomb threat. So the, you know, law enforcement swoops in, everybody gets moved out of the auditorium. I miss my opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one with Senator Barry Goldwater. Well, a couple weeks later, in the mail, I received the sweetest note, handwritten note from Senator Goldwater apologizing that he was unable to have that interview. And you know, it, he didn't have to do that. I just thought he was, you know, truly a, a gentleman and uh, sending me that note. So that's my little Barry Goldwater story. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us and going through um, a really insightful historical analysis of our elections throughout the U.S. history and how that reflects on today. Um, I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you, Chief. Thank you so much. Thank you.